Lift your hands and magnify him, will you? If you love the Lord, magnify him today. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless be the name of the Lord, bless the name of the Lord, bless the name of the Lord. Praise God. We have in church today a real hero of the United Pentecostal Church International, Brother and Sister Staten from Washington, D.C., metro area, are here, church planters, soul winners. I love you folks. Honored to have you here today. He's one of them guys that decided to sneak in instead of calling me ahead of time because I think he knew I'd have probably had him up here preaching this morning if I'd known he was coming. I love Brother Staten and his wife and their family and all that they're doing for the kingdom of God. Anybody love the Lord today? I'm going to give you fair warning. I'm going to ask that again, only this time I want you to actually convince me. Does anybody love the Lord today? That's a little bit better. God's been good to us, folks. Thank you, Jesus. I'm preaching today from the subject, How Giants Fall. How Giants Fall fall. We all have giants in our life. We're all facing giants. We are all in fact fighting giants right now. There's nobody here who is not dealing with a giant of some kind in their life right now. Giants like fear. Giants like failure. Giants like past mistakes. Giants like lust, giants like bitterness and hatred. There's all kind of giants that we face in our life. I want to talk to you today about how giants fall. God bless you. You may be seated. I'm going to start out today by reading you a Bible story from a version of the scripture that I very seldom ever read publicly from. I'm going to read to you from the New Living Translation, and I'm going to read 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now, there's 58 verses in that chapter. I'm not going to read them all, but I am going to read probably 25 or 30 of them. I want you to listen carefully, if you would, please. 1 Samuel 17, verse 4. Goliath. A Philistine champion from Gath came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. Verse 5, he wore a bronze helmet and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. He also, verse 6, he also wore bronze leg armor and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. Verse 7, the shaft of his spear was as heavy and as thick as a weaver's beam tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. Verse 8. Goliath challenged the army of Israel, Choose one man to come down here and fight me. And if he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. Verse 11. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. David's three oldest brothers, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shimea, had already joined Saul's army to fight the Philistines. And as soon as the Israelite army, verse 24, saw Goliath, they began to run in fright. Verse 26, David asked, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that dares defy the armies? Of the living God. Verse 31. David's words were reported to King Saul, and the king sent for him. Verse 32. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Verse 33. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. 
There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. Verse 37, the same God, David said, who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Verse 40, David picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag and then armed only with his shepherd's staff and a sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Verse 41, Goliath Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him. Verse 43, Goliath said, Am I a dog? He roared at David, That you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the name of his gods. Verse 44, Goliath yelled, Today I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. Verse 45, David replied to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear. But I come to you in the name of the Lord. Verse 46, David said, Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Verse 47, Everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. Verse 48, as Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Verse 49. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. And the stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. Verse 51. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath and David used it to kill him and cut off his head how giants fall before I start preaching this morning allow me to kind of level the playing field number one we all have giants in our life there's not one person here, no matter how they look, no matter what their name is, no matter how long they've been around here, how spiritual they are, there's not one person here who doesn't have giants in their life and giants that they're fighting with even now. No matter how long you've been a Christian, you have giants in your life. No matter how much faith you possess, you have giants in your life no matter how gifted you are you have giants in your life you can be the kindest the sweetest the gentlest the most caring individual the world has ever known and you have giants in your life in our story today David arrives at the encampment of the Israelites, specifically there to see his brethren. David is just a teenager. He's a shepherd boy, not old enough to have gone with his older brothers to join the military. He is in fact sent on this day by his father to take cheese and bread to his three older brothers who are soldiers. He's also given the task to bring back from the battle a report of the battle to his father, Jesse. The first thing David sees when he arrives in the camp of the Israelites is not an army that's ready to fight, not an army that is preparing that one guy that'll go out and fight the giant, their best man he finds Israel cowering in their tents he finds the army of God if you please all frightened by the cries of this giant the first thing David hears when he gets to the battle is the voice of Goliath that roaring booming voice 
of a nine foot six inch tall Philistine giant crying out, send me a man that we might fight. And if he defeats me, we'll be your slaves. But if I defeat him, you'll be our slaves. And the first thing that David says when he gets to the place of the battle, this little boy, a teenager, a shepherd boy, not old enough to be a soldier, the first words that come out of his mouth is, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? By uncircumcised, he meant pagan, an idol God worshiper. Who is this pagan Philistine that would dare defy the armies of the living God? Now, our giants are not Goliath. Our giants are not human. In fact, I would present to you that in many cases represented in this building, if our giants were human, they'd be easier to take care of. We're dealing with giants like the giant of fear. Many of us live with fear. Many people in this building every day get up with fear and go to bed every night with fear. We're dealing with the giant of intimidation. Everywhere we go, everybody we meet, every setting, every circumstance, we feel intimidated. We deal with the giant of loneliness. We deal with the giant of bitterness. Somebody hurt us. You know, I don't argue with people when they say they've been hurt. I don't ever tell people you shouldn't have been hurt. I don't ever tell people you ought not have, a, have allowed that hurt to take place in your life. I do tell them that as long as you let that giant control you, you're not going to know freedom. We deal with a giant of hatred. That's what happens to bitterness whenever it's not ever brought under control. It eventually turns into hatred. And there are people in this building that are good people that down deep inside of them is hatred for somebody or something. We deal with the giants of lust, desiring the wrong thing, desiring the wrong person, desiring the wrong goal. And that giant just doesn't seem to ever let up. We deal with the giants of emotional turmoil. We deal with the giant of confusion. We deal with the giant of destructive habits. I'm not asking for a head nod or even a hand raise or nothing. Just sit there as, as generic as you possibly can. But I'm wondering as a pastor, how many people in this building today are, are living for the giant of destructive habits? You do things you know are destructive. You do things to relationships. You do things to important friendships. You do things to your walk with God that you know are destructive but you just keep doing it over and over and over again it's because that giant is still in control in that area of your life we deal with giants of unfaithfulness we deal with giants are you ready for this of painful memories we deal with giants of past mistakes and past failures. That's only a short list of all the giants that we're facing as individuals. I'm not talking today about a giant that's come against Bible world. We can whoop him. You can whoop him. I don't want to overemphasize the giant and his power and his effect. I'm not doing that. Stick with me and I'll tell you before we're done today exactly what we're going to do with them and where we're going to put them. But I'm telling you that when it comes to spirits that come against the church, we do what we're going to do the next three days. We're going to pray and we're going to fast and God's going to give us the victory.
I could tell you about some demon, some, some plot in hell that has come against Bible World Church. And I could say how many of you will pray and fast. Probably all of you would stand up and say, Preacher, we'll, we'll go with you. We'll whoop that devil with you. But it's amazing how much faith we can have for somebody else's giant or some other entity's giant. And then we got a ring in our nose and we're being led around by a giant every single day of our life that we're thinking we have no control over. Y'all still with me? When you fight with a giant, you have to have a strategy that guarantees victory. Let me give you a simple strategy for fighting with the giant. Number one, you have to face your giant. Giants don't go away by ignoring them. The proverbial ostrich stance don't work here. You can't put your head in the sand and think I'll just pretend like that giant's not there. I'll just pretend like I don't have those feelings, those desires. I'll just pretend I never have those thoughts. I don't, I'm not plagued by bad memories, past failures, and, and past mistakes. I'll just pretend like that don't exist. The first thing you've got to do to put a giant in his place is you have to face your giant. You've got to go toe-to-toe with your giant. Say amen, somebody. Too many children of God are living with giants of fear and pain and condemnation and they just go on and on and on and on and on and they learn to live with it. Can I give you a simple verse of scripture? Those of you that are dealing with fear, the Bible says God hath not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Somebody ought to hear me today. You're afraid of your own shadow. You're afraid this is going to happen. I'm afraid that's going to happen. I'm afraid this person's going to say this. I'm afraid that person's going to say that. I'm afraid of my past. I'm afraid of my failures. I'm afraid my mistakes are going to come to light. It's fear. And fear doesn't come from God. God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Somebody get me another microphone, please. You all are killing me up here. What little bit of voice I got is fixing to go south. Somebody said, praise the Lord. Amen. My Lord, should have started out with that one. If you've got fear, it didn't come from God. What's that mean, preacher? Listen to me. If you've got fear, it didn't come from God. If there's fear controlling your life, fear controlling your mind, fear controlling your ability to be happy, Fear controlling your ability to be successful in anything. That fear didn't come from God. And if it didn't come from God, it means it either come from man, including yourself, or it come from the devil. And somebody needs to understand both man and the devil are subject to God. Somebody shout yes. Number one, face your giant. Number two, slay your giant. I want that to sink in just for a second. Quit trying to figure out how to live with your giant. You know, they say when you're preaching, quiet means consent. Is that what's happening here or... Am I just not making sense today? Quit trying to learn how to live with your giant. 
You don't have to learn how to live with fear. You don't have to learn how to live with pain. You don't have to learn how to live under the cloud of your past mistakes and your past failures. You don't have to learn to live with that habit that seems like it has you bound. Number one, once you face your giant, the next step that you've got to take is we're going to slay that giant. We're going to deal with that giant. We're going to do it in the name of Jesus. We're going to do it under the power of the Holy Ghost. Somebody shout yes. When you stop short of slaying the giant. Anybody listening to me? When you stop short of slaying the giant, you are in essence inviting him back. Once you've faced your giant, once you've done battle with your giant, the second step has got to be, I'm going to kill the giant. Not going to let him live. There's no mercy for giants. Come on, somebody. And if you leave him alive, he will come back. Somebody said amen. And then third, you face your giant, you slay your giant, and then number three is you move on. What the devil wants of us is to live in a dimension less than what God has provided us. He wants you, he don't mind you come to church. He don't mind you dressing holy, looking holy, talking holy, acting holy. He don't mind if you juke and jive and jump and run and stomp and spit. He don't care about that stuff as long as you're not living up to your apostolic potential. As long as you're not living as a victorious Christian. As long as you're not an overcomer. As long as you're not free from him, he don't care what else you do. And some of us have thought good enough is okay. Zig Ziglar said the number one enemy of excellence is good enough. And there's too many children of God that are, that are settling for good enough. Well, this is better than I used to be. It's good enough. No, 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 no. You got to face the giant. You got to slay the giant. And then you got to move on. Moving on means changing the way you talk. Moving on means changing the way you think. Moving on means changing your actions. Say amen, somebody. Are y'all still with me? I'm going to stop here for a little bit and talk about this for a little while because it seems to me like I've hit something here. We cannot allow negative hostile, crippling giants to take up residence in our life, our mind, our emotions, our spirit. Everything about our life is affected when you agree to live with a giant. Mm -mm -mm. If we do, if we do agree to live with giants, then we are surrendering our happiness. We're surrendering our spirituality. We are surrendering our home. We're surrendering our marriage. We're surrendering our family. We're surrendering our sanity. We're surrendering everything we are and everything that could be good to the giant. I don't want to live with a giant. I don't want a giant living with me. I try to catch up on the news every night. I did last night. It was after midnight when I got in bed. 
and I went to sleep with Fox News on my telephone, on my nightstand up there. I just play in little snippets of different things that are happening. I, I listen to all the news. I listen to the news program. I listen to Fox News. I listen to CNN. And the reason is because I don't believe none of them. And I'm thinking that somewhere in the middle might be the truth. And so I try to get every single perspective and then draw my own conclusions. But that's how I went to sleep last night, was listening to the news. And it's pretty much how I go to sleep every night of the year. I heard a story. I saw, I actually saw the interview. When they introduced a man to come on stage, their little talk show group there, the man is walking with a leash and a full-grown lion, male lion. Big head of hair, big mane. That lion's head was nearly as tall as that man was. His back must have been three, three and a half, four feet tall. Great big lion, great big tail, Arr, big old thing. And he comes out there to be interviewed. And in the interview, they ask the man, you keep this lion in your house? He said, yeah. Are you afraid of him? He said, sometimes. The interviewer said, where does he sleep? And the owner said, anywhere he wants to. <laughs> and the owner was asked, what does he do? And the owner said, anything he wants to do. And they asked him, what does he eat? He said, anything or anyone. He wants to. And I'm sitting there thinking, I don't have a Harvard degree. Sorry, Elsie. But you got to be stone cold stupid. Hello? You got to be dumber than a box of rocks. Dumber than two sled tracks. Any way you want to say it. To agree to live with a full grown lion. When Google is full of stories of people that raised lions that turned on them and killed them. Hello? And you're all laughing. All of you bobbing. I'm looking at you bobbing your heads. Whoa. All of you laughing. All that kind of stuff. And guess what? You got a giant living in your house. Where does he sleep? Anywhere he wants to. What's he do to you? Anything he wants to do. What does he eat? Anything or anybody he wants to. And you're learning to live with that in your house, in your mind, in your spirit, in your marriage, in your family, in your relationship with God. I've come to preach to us today, folks, that we've got to make our minds up that we're not going to allow giants to take up residence in our life. We're not going to let them take over our life, any part of it. We're not going to let them control our mind or our emotions. We're not going to let them destroy our relationship with God. We're not going to let him destroy our relationship with other people. But we got our mind made up that Today's the day the giant's coming down. Today's the day I'm going to face my giant. I'm going to slay my giant. And then I'm moving on to victory. I'm moving on to blessing. I'm moving on to favor. Somebody shout yes. You may be seated. I don't want to scare you, but I'm on page 6 of 14 pages of notes. When David arrives at the encampment of the army of Israel, his older brethren, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shimei, 
like all the other soldiers, are hiding from the giant. The Bible says that all the army of Israel was frightened every time that giant said a word. One thing David figured out pretty quick when he got there was that his oldest brother, Eliab, he has no intentions of fighting that giant. His second brother, Abinadab, and the third, Shimea, they're hiding behind their big brother and they're letting everybody know we ain't fighting him. And then... Saul, the king of Israel, God's anointed. One place in the scripture said he stood head and shoulders taller than all the men of Israel. He was a big man himself. Not nine foot six inches tall, but he might have been six foot ten, seven foot. Head and shoulders taller than the other men. And when they bring David to Saul, did they find Saul out on the front line with his armor on and his shield and his sword? I'm the commander in chief and I'm not afraid of that giant. No. Saul's in his tent. Doors closed. And the Bible takes time to say Saul's armor is hanging on a peg. You know what Saul wanted everybody to know? If y'all thinking I'm going to go fight him. I'm staying in my tent with the door closed and armor hanging on a peg. I don't want anybody thinking I'm going out there. Hello? It don't matter who you are. It don't matter how spiritual you are. It doesn't matter how much money you put in around here. It doesn't matter what your name is. It doesn't matter how long you've been here. You can be as great as Saul, head and shoulders taller than all the rest of us, and you might be king around here. You may be special around here. But, honey, if you're willing to live with giants, the giant's going to move in, and he don't care who you are. Your position don't matter to him. Your spirituality don't matter to the giant. All of Israel, the Bible said, our King James said, they're sore afraid. And in that, that setting, his older brothers are afraid. King Saul's afraid. The army's afraid. This little old ruddy boy, what's the word ruddy mean? It means he doesn't shave yet. This little old ruddy faced boy boy says let me fight him I ain't afraid of him send me out there to fight the giant you know every now and then this isn't my sermon but every now and then God uses someone that's not so obvious to teach the rest of us a lesson if you watch There's some folks around here teaching lessons that wasn't on this platform with me. They're not a pastor. They don't hold a big position. But if you'll watch them, every now and then they have a success in their relationship with God that the rest of us ought to take note of. Let me add him. I'll fight him. And when David said that, his older brothers became angry with him. David's boldness, his willingness to fight, and most of all, his words. It didn't just make them angry. The truth is they were embarrassed that their little brother had more faith in God than they did. Oh, there's so much preaching in this one chapter. They said he's just a naughty boy. That's what the Bible said, a naughty boy. In 2019, we'd say he's just a smart aleck. 
He's just a naughty boy. Can I, let me pause here for just a second and tell you that people who are afraid of the giant criticize those who are not. People who won't fight with the giant are not afraid to fight with people who fight with the giant. People who are cowering in safe places, they spew their hatred on frontline giant fighters. People who have never in their life fought their own giant are the ones that want to tell giant fighters how to fight giants. People who allow giants to abuse them become professional haters. Only they don't hate the giant. They hate the people that are trying to kill giants. We need to quit worrying about the haters around here. Can we got any haters at Bible World? If you don't know, I ain't telling you. But if you do know, you know. Hello? We need to quit worrying about the haters. Some of you ain't going to like it and you think your pastor's backslid. But you don't need to pay no attention to haters. You don't need to pay no attention to people that are trying to rough you up. It's mostly because they're jealous. It's mostly because you're saying, let me at them, I'll fight them. I don't intend to live like this. I don't intend to let the devil put a ring in my nose. And Here's where you're going to think I'm backslidden. But I'm quoting Brother T.F. Tenney. He said, as long as they're kicking you in the butt, at least you know you're out in front of them. Hello? You need to quit, 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 quit. Allowing haters to determine your happiness and your success. I don't care who says you can't do it. The Word of God said you can do it. I don't care who says the giant's in charge. The Word of God said the giant's not in charge. Somebody said amen. Somebody said amen. Now... When David comes in to meet Saul, Saul has a really weird idea of a pep talk. I mean, it's weird. David walks into Saul's tent. Saul says, David, I heard you're willing to fight the giant. Yes, sir, I am. Saul said, you're just a boy. And he's been a warrior since he was a boy. He said he's nine foot six inches tall. And you're just a ruddy faced teen. Goliath wears a bronze helmet. His bronze armor weighs 125 pounds. He wears bronze leg armor. Carries a bronze javelin. His spear is heavy and thick as a weaver's beam with an iron spearhead that weighs 15 pounds. And all you have is a boy's sling, a shepherd boy's sling and five smooth stones. Sometimes, I want to be careful how I say this, Sometimes the people that ought to be encouraging you are only telling you what you can't do, what you're not equipped to do, 
what you're not old enough in the Lord yet to do. Sometimes it's the people that ought to be encouraging you along, encouraging you to go on. Come on, take that step of faith. They're the ones that are saying, better be careful. You know, you don't have, compared to this problem, you don't have everything you need. You're not big enough. You're not strong enough. You're not old enough. You're not smart enough. I'm still talking about how the giants fall. Saul said, Goliath's too big, too experienced, and too strong. And David's attitude toward what Saul says is the same God. The same God that delivered me from the mouth of the lion and the claws of the bear will deliver me from this pagan, idol-worshiping, uncircumcised Philistine. Let me pause here and say to you, you you ought not ever tell a real giant killer that they're not strong enough, that they're not old enough, that they're not experienced enough, that their God's not able because a real giant killer has already killed a lion and already killed a bear and they know that the same God that delivered me back there is going to deliver me here and he'll deliver me again tomorrow. The giant's not going to win. Somebody shout yes Giant killers understand Are there any giant killers in this house? If there is, you understand. If it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, my faith isn't in men. My faith isn't in systems. My faith isn't in any group. My faith's not in a bank account. My faith's not in a government. My faith is in God. And if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, Giant killers understand no weapon, no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. You know what some of us believe? We believe most weapons. We believe some weapons. The Bible said no weapon. No weapon formed against you is going to prosper. I'm here to tell somebody in this church on Sunday morning that's been living with a giant in your house too long. You've been living with a giant in your brain too long. You've been living with a giant... And I've come to tell you that the Bible says no weapon. That was yesterday's giants. That's today's giants. And that's tomorrow's giants. There's never going to be a giant that comes against you that's going to prosper as long as your faith is in God. As long as your faith is in God. I said as long as your faith is in God. Giant killers understand, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Giant killers understand, if God be for us, who, who can be against us? Giant killers understand, God's whispering in their ear, be still and see the salvation of the Lord. Giant killers understand, hold your peace, for the Lord is going to fight your battle. Giant killers understand, the enemy going to come in one way, but they're going to flee seven. Come on, somebody. It's time to kill giants. It's time to bring down giants. Somebody shout yes. You've got to love David's boldness. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine who dares 
to defy the army of God. Every now and then you ought to look at the giant and say, just who do you think you are? Giant killers are bold. Giant killers are bold in their faith. Bold in their statements. Bold in what they declare they believe about God. I've told you before, but I'll tell you again. What comes out of your mouth when you're facing a giant is integral to the outcome of the battle. The Bible says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. What does that mean, Brother Cunningham? It means you can either speak death into a situation or you can speak life into a situation. It means that what you say matters. What comes out of your mouth matters. Oh, you're not going to like what I'm fixing to say. My mama back there, God bless her precious heart. Greatest mama that ever lived on the face of this earth. But my mama used to have to tell my sisters often. (laughs) If you can't say something good then don't say nothing. Hello? It's a principle that some of us ought to learn in our walk with God. Because when you walk away, this is the battle that's going to kill me. Oh, children, this is a battle going to destroy our family. This is going to destroy our finances. This is going to... You're speaking things into the atmosphere that you really don't want to come to pass. What you ought to say to the giant is who do you think you are? Do you really think you can stand against my God? Do you really think that you've got the power. It matters what comes out of your mouth. One of my best friend's wife died this weekend. Brother Bruce Howe and I go back years and years and years and years. He called me right after Diane died. He said, Jack, she's gone. It's the third or fourth time we've talked this week. We talk often. And I'm telling you that Bruce has never one time said anything other to me than God's going to heal Diane. God's going to heal Diane. God's going to heal Diane. So hold on, Brother Cunningham. She died. Listen to me when I tell you. Giant killers don't ever speak negative into existence she hadn't taken a bite in 14 days they were putting drops of water in her mouth for the last 14 days you think they haven't known for at least 14 days that her days were numbered and yet every time I spoke to Bruce Jack God's going to heal Diane Jack God can heal Diane God can heal Diane. What is he doing? He's a giant killer. He's killed giants all over the world. He's faced all kind of giants. None like this one he's facing right now with the loss of his wife of 46 years. But you hear me when I tell you. Listen to me when I tell you. What comes out of your mouth is of paramount importance in the time of trouble. You don't need to become the mouthpiece of the giant. You don't need to speak what the giant is speaking. You don't need to say what the giant is saying you don't need to express the emotions of the giant you need to be saying what God wants you to say you need to be expressing your faith in God every time you open your mouth say amen somebody say amen somebody Goliath challenged David's faith and David declared the same God Who delivered me from the lion and the bear will deliver me from this giant.
David's older brothers challenged his faith and he declared the same God who delivered me from the lion and the bear will deliver me from this Philistine. King Saul challenged David's faith and David declared the same God who delivered me from the lion and the bear will deliver me also from this giant. There is nothing more powerful, child of God, than your declaration of your faith in God. There's nothing more powerful. When David met Goliath on the field of battle, the first words that came out of his mouth, no introductions, hey, my name's David. Oh, behave, Cunningham. You know what I think is another stupid thing? There goes behave right out the window. People that ask the devil what his name is. First of all, the Bible said he's a liar and the father of all lies. You think he's going to tell you the truth? He can be a little old stupid, wet behind the ears, devil imp, and he'll tell you his name is Lucifer. Hello? Some little old stupid rogue devil. And he'll say, I'm legion. And we're dumb enough to believe him. Who cares what his name is? There's only one name that matters in that scenario. And it's the name Jesus. David didn't go out there and introduce himself. He didn't go out there and say, my name's David, what's yours? He didn't have any small talk with him or nothing like that. Whenever he walks out on the field of battle, David's first words, first words, first thing come out of his mouth. You come to me with sword and spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. He didn't say, I come with a sling and five stones. That's what Saul thought he was taking to battle. David wanted to set the record straight. It don't matter if I have armor or not. It don't matter if I got a sword and spear or not. It don't matter if I'm fighting with a sling and a smooth stone or not. The only thing that matters is I come to you in the name, the name, the name of the Lord. Do you know what every giant is afraid of? The name. The name. That name you know. We're Jesus' name people. We are people of the name. We know the power of the name. I don't have time to preach it. But in Philippians 2 and 10, my God, what a a verse of scripture. At the name of Jesus. Somebody say every knee. Say every giant. Come on, say every giant. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Are you ready for the second part of that verse? He said, number one, hold up one finger. He said, of things in heaven. Number two, and things in earth. Number three, and things under the earth. Things in heaven are angels. Things in earth are men. Things under the earth is devils. And the Bible said, it don't matter what dimension you're in, whether you're an angel or a man or a devil, when that name is invoked. name of Jesus oh preacher my family don't matter in earth they're under the name of Jesus oh preacher my boss don't matter that's a man under the name of Jesus oh preacher my neighbor don't matter that's under the name of Jesus preacher my mom my dad my sister my brother my aunt my uncle don't matter that's men under the name of Jesus Preacher, every devil in hell's come against me. It doesn't matter. When you say the name of Jesus, it says everything is going to bow. 
everything is going to bow. Your people of the name, don't you lose the greatest tool that you have to fight giants. You know that name. You were baptized in that name. You know the power of that name. Somebody shout yes. Shout yes. You see, a Jesus named giant killer will never face a giant they don't have power over. Oh, preacher, I made a mistake 40 years ago. And I think about it every day. Every day I think it's going to, it's time for that giant to be killed. You got to face the giant, slay the giant, and then move on to victory. Move on to blessing. Move on to favor. Brother Cunningham, I'm just a fearful person. I'm always thinking everything that can go wrong will go wrong. I'm just afraid of this and afraid of that and afraid of something else. You need to face that giant. You need to slay that giant and then move on to blessing and move on to favor. Oh, Brother Cunningham, I've got desires that I know don't please God. You got to face that giant. You got to slay that giant and then you got to move on to victory. Come on, somebody here today. I don't care how long that giant's been around. I come to to tell you. I come to this service to tell you here is how giants fall. This is the way giants fall. Somebody shout yes. Come on shout yes. Let me hurry to a finish. David's on the battlefield. He's just told Goliath, you come to me with sword and spear, I come to you in the name of the Lord. The old Goliath screams at him, I'm going to feed your carcass boy today to the birds and the wild beast. David said, I'm going to knock you down and cut your head off. Mm. I don't have time to preach all I want to preach. I should have quit four minutes ago. Hear me. Hear me. What David said. How many verses before he actually swung that sling and loosed that rock that hit the giant in the forehead? How many verses before that did David specifically say, I'm going to knock you down and then I'm going to cut off your head? And verses later, what happened? Exactly what he said. Exactly what he said. David said, I'm going to cut your head off. Let's look at the story. I want to point out to you that the Bible says there's no wasted words in your Bible. There's nothing in your Bible by mistake. The Bible said that David ran toward the giant. I think some of us have the idea that if we're going to take a sling to fight a giant, we learn how to throw it over our shoulder, running away from him. How good did I? How good am I of getting it behind my back? Now that little boy that's just a ruddy-faced boy, just a little teenager that don't even shave yet, and he's got no armor on. The Bible said he ran right straight toward that giant and he loosed that sling and it hit that giant in the right spot and it dug into his head and that giant hit the ground face first. What are you trying to say, Brother Cunningham? You've been running away from the giant for too long. On this Sunday morning, It's time to run toward the giant. Hold on just a second. I I wish you could get the picture. Come here, Ashton. You're pretty tall. Grab that front chair and bring it with you, that empty chair. Bring it with you. Stand up on that chair over there. How tall are you? 6'2". So you're still a foot and a half shorter than him. You'd be eight foot two on a two foot chair. That giant was nine foot six inches tall. Give me a boy. Come here, son, the blue shirt. Come here. Come on. 
Stand right over here. Come here. Here's David, and there's the giant. He didn't, he didn't run away from David. He didn't run away from the giant. David didn't. But the Bible said he ran toward the giant. And he let that sling go. And that giant fell. What are you trying to say, Brother Cunningham? David understood. If this don't work, I'm going to be within arm reach of this dude when I'm done. If this don't work, I'm putting... You talking about faith, folks. When the Bible said put on the whole armor of God, have you noticed there's no armor for the back? It's never okay when fighting spiritual warfare to go into retreat and run from the enemy and think everything's going to be okay. you got to have enough faith and run toward that giant knowing that if I miss, if God don't come through, I'm going to be an arm's length of that big old boy. But I'm still running at him because I believe God is my deliverer and God is my hope and God is my help. Thank you. He runs toward the giant. He throws the stone. When you're facing a giant, when you're facing a giant, y'all may want to sit down for this. That way you're not standing up if I say something you don't agree with. When you're facing a giant going to church no matter how you feel is running toward the giant. When you're facing a giant worshiping God when you get here no matter how you feel, is running toward the giant. Preacher, I got a giant in my life. Then you ought to be clapping your hands like a crazy man or woman. You ought to be stomping your feet. You ought to be dancing before the Lord. You ought to be running laps around this place. You say, Brother Cunningham, I haven't killed him yet. Honey, that's the way you kill him. That's the way you run toward the giant. Somebody shout yes. When you preach with the preacher, no matter how you feel, you're running toward the giant. Say amen. Oh, my Lord. Don't run away. You've been running too long. Some of you have come to church and went home three times a week for years with the same giant. And I'm telling you that on this Sunday morning, we're going to face the giant, we're going to slay the giant, and then we're going to move on to blessing. We're going to move on to victory. Some of you have learned to live with him. Some of you goes where he tells you go. You think like he wants you to think. You act like he wants you to act. You respond the way he wants you to respond. It controls every important area of your life. And I'm telling you that today, Somebody holler today. Come on, somebody holler today. Today we're going to face the giant. Today we're going to slay the giant. And today we're going to move on to victory. I wish I could remember the song. But years ago we used to sing a song that said, Sing a little louder. I don't remember what it was. I just remember a few words. Sing a little louder. Clap a little harder. Dance a little more. I'm probably butchering it. But the truth of the matter is, is the worse you feel, 
the more you ought to worship. Hold on. This idea that our worship should be based on how we're feeling at the time is wrong. I was preaching the Illinois camp meeting this summer and I told them, I said, it's time for crazy worship. It's time for some of you to just go nuts worshiping God. It's time for some of you to remember how you worshiped when you was a new convert, the way you jumped and run before you got so sophisticated, before you think you're all that, before you got to where you believed you're more than you are and now you're nothing but dried up, half dead, Come on, somebody. It don't matter what you're going through. It don't matter how you feel. It don't matter what that old giant's been saying in your head. I dare you to get up on your feet. I dare you to clap your hands. I dare you to dance before the Lord. I dare you to take off running. I dare you to stomp. I dare you to scream. Somebody's running toward the giant right now. Somebody's fixing to let the sling go. Somebody's fixing to send that rock to the temple of the giant that's going to bring him down. Somebody's about ready to have a victory. Back up here, Ashton. Lay right here on the floor where everybody can see you. Little David. And lets that rock go. He's almost in arm's grasp of that giant. And he's hit the giant right in the forehead. And the giant fell over and is laying on the ground. Everybody said he's knocked out. Say it again, he's knocked out. Well, guess what? Rocky got knocked out in Rocky 2 or 3, wasn't it? And come back and won in 3, 4, 5, and 6, or however many there is. There's times that you're going to knock out the enemy. Giant is laying there, knocked out. knocked out and the Bible said David thought I'm not just going to face my giant I'm not just going to slay my giant I'm not just going to knock him out knocked out giants get back up again knocked out giants wake up and come back David said, this ends today, right here, right now. And David goes and takes Goliath's own sword out of his hand. And the Bible said he cut off his head and killed him. Now, the fact that the Bible said that's when he killed him means he was not dead yet. And giants that are left alive come back. You got to kill it. I preach the whole message to tell you this. You're the only one. I can't do it for you. Our pastors can't do it. Your spouse can't do it for you. Mom and dad can't do it for you. First of all, most of us don't know the name. The kind of giant you're fighting. And I recommend you not tell everybody around you the giant you're fighting. 
You're the only one that knows what that giant is. And because of that, you're the only one that can kill the giant. Preacher, what do you want me to do? In about three minutes, I'm going to open this altar up. And I want you to step out of your seat, coming down this aisle, saying out loud, I'm going down there to kill a giant. I'm going down front to kill a giant. I want you to bring to this altar your fear. Put it on the altar with the idea that I'm walking away from it. I want you to bring your past and put it on the altar. And I'm going to worship God and then walk away from it. I want you to bring to this altar all of that desires and all of those things that plagued you. All of those habits you haven't had control over. And I want you to put them on the altar. I want you to physically walk out of your seat saying, I'm going down there to kill a giant. Today I'm facing my giant. I'm going to slay my giant and then I'm going to move on to victory. Today today I'm facing my giant. I'm going to slay the giant and I'm moving on to blessing. I'm moving on to favor. I'm not living this way anymore. I'm not carrying this around anymore. I'm not walking this way anymore. I'm moving on to victory. you got a giant in your life, you ought to be moving right now. And you ought to be speaking the word of faith every step you take. Come on, don't you come down here negative. Come down here speaking the word of faith. I'm going to go kill a giant. I'm not living this way no more. I'm not walking with this thing any longer. I'm not allowing it to have control of my mind, my marriage, my money, my life any longer. There you go, lay it on the altar. It don't matter what it is, lay it on the altar. It doesn't matter how long it's been plaguing you, today it goes on the altar. It doesn't matter what the enemy's been trying to tell you, today it goes on the altar. The same God that delivered you yesterday is going to deliver you from this giant today. The same God that has always been on your side, he's on your side right now. I want our ministers today to be led by the Holy Ghost. I want you to specifically go pray for people that God gives you a word for, that God gives you a spiritual unction, a spiritual faith for that person. I want you to be led by the Holy Ghost.
be led by the Holy Ghost. Let the Holy Ghost lead you to somebody. Lay your hand on them and pray the prayer of faith. Take apostolic authority. Take apostolic authority over every giant in their life. I want everybody under the sound of my voice, close your eyes, get your mind on God, and raise both of your hands to heaven. Everybody under the sound of my voice, raise both of your hands to heaven. I'm going to speak the word of faith over you as your pastor and shepherd. And when I speak the word of faith, I want you to let out the greatest shout of hallelujah praises to God that you've ever given him in your lifetime. Here goes, by the authority of the word of God, and by the power that is in the name Jesus, I command the giants to fall. I command the giants to die. I take authority over every giant in the name of Jesus. Now shout, 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 shout. Real worshipers can worship without music, without a beat, without all of that stuff, the singing. If you're a real worshiper and you believe that God's give you victory over the giant in your life, I want you to begin to worship him right now. I want you to worship. I want you to dance. I want you to leap. I want you to wave your arms, clap your hands, lift up your voice. Come on, worship. Now, I want everybody to listen to me for just a second. Several years ago, my wife and I pastored a couple. Had lots of problems in their life. They had been, the, in, the, they'd been in different religions. They had been involved in the occult. They had tried to summon evil spirits. They told me stories of things they did in their house. They were promiscuous, both of them, husband and wife probably had what would be called an open marriage. They had all kind of habits, all kind of things that were a mess 
in their life and marriage. They come in, got baptized, got the Holy Ghost. The very day they got the Holy Ghost, the day they got the Holy Ghost, my wife and I took them out to lunch. Brand spanking new couple. The girl's dad was a Baptist preacher. We took them out to lunch, and they said to us at lunch, they said, we want you to tell us everything we need to do to be right with God. And most new converts, you don't do that to. You give them time to grow in the Lord, into a relationship. And I gave them a generic answer. I said, you know what? We're going to get to all of that. We got a discipleship class, and we'll teach you things, and we'll take 12, 15 weeks to teach. And, and while I'm trying to give this generic answer, the wife said, no, you're going to tell us today. She said, because we've done everything the devil ever wanted us to do. And today, you're going to tell us what we need to do to please God. She said, I guess your church believes in tithing. Her dad was a Baptist minister. And she said, I guess your church believes in tithing. I said, yes, ma'am, we do. She said, we'll be paying our tithes tomorrow. We'll bring them back to the church. She said, I notice I'm the only woman there dressed like I'm dressed. And she was dressed very immodestly. And I said, yes, ma'am. He said, how do you want the women to dress? I'd never done this with new converts before. She said, I'm the only one there that looks like this and that. Is that wrong? I've never done that with new converts before. They wanted to know every single thing they needed to do that day. This is Sunday evening. They prayed through Sunday morning. Monday after work, the husband worked at the Newport News Shipyard. Monday after work, he called me. He said, Pastor, when I got home today, there was a bonfire in our yard. I said, what's that? Big old fire in our front yard. I said, well, what in the world happened? He said, my wife went through all the house, threw away everything you told us we didn't need in our life. When I got home, it's in a bonfire in the front yard. She burned up all the music, burned up all the old clothes, burned up all the immodest stuff. Burned up all of our Ouija boards and all those games we used. It's all in a bonfire in the front yard. That man is still in the church today. That would be 35 some years later. Now here's what I'm telling somebody. Because my whole message isn't worth a mouthful of spit if I don't send you home with this. If you go back home and pick up the same giant. If you walk out of here and in the parking lot, you say the same thing you said coming in here. If you get in the car with your spouse and family and you start down the same old road you've Spiritually, we all need a bonfire in the front yard. Our, change, our thinking's got to change. Our attitude's got to change or the giant is still alive. You may have knocked him down with your worship and your prayer and when someone laid hands on you or someone joined hand with you and spoke the word of faith and agreed with you, you may have knocked him down but you haven't killed him if you're still talking like you were. If you're still thinking like you were. Hello? If you've still got the stuff in your life. If the habits, the wrong habits. Nobody's got to tell you what's a wrong habit. You know. Hello? Nobody's got to judge you and tell you you ought not be doing it. You know what you're supposed to do. And not do. Right? Right? And if you leave this service and go right back to doing it again, the giant is still alive. You've got to have a spiritual bonfire. You've got to say, I want it out of my life. I want everything out of my life that makes me think wrong. Everything that makes me have wrong desires, I want it out of my life. 
everything that, that I say that is wrong, God put a gate on my... You know, there's a Bible for that, Bible verse for that. There's a place in the Bible where a man of God said, God put a gate at my mouth. What was that for? So I'll not say things I shouldn't say. And some of us need to change the way we talk. Stop the negative talk. Stop the critical talk. Stop the hateful talk. My message isn't worth nothing if I don't leave you with this. You've got to kill the giant. You can't just come to church and shout. That's a knockdown. I'll guarantee you that. But you got to go ahead and kill him. It means you got to leave here different than you came. It means you got to leave here with your mind made up. I'm not thinking that way. I'm not talking that way. I'm not going there. I'm not doing that. I'm not wearing this. I'm not participating in that. And if it's a person that keeps dragging you down, I'm not running with them no more. Where's Brother Troy at? Brother Troy, come on up here. Come on up here. I want Troy to pray for us. I want him to pray that God will help every one of us. Guess what? Pastors got giants. I told you earlier, it don't matter who you are. Everybody's got, is there anybody here who don't? Is there anybody here that thinks I wasted my time today? You got no giant in your life. Because if you raise your hand, I know one big giant. You're a liar. You got one great big one you need to get over. It don't matter who you are. I don't care how long you've been here. I don't care what your name is. I don't care how much money you give. I don't care how long you pray. I don't care if you got all nine gifts of the Spirit operating in your life. I don't care if you can preach like an angel. You got giants. And I'm going to ask Troy to pray that we not just knock them down, but that God gives us the wherewithal. That God puts within us a spiritual stamina. That God puts within us a spiritual desire, a spiritual determination. I'm going to kill the giant. I've knocked him down. I'm going to cut his head off right now. I'm going to cut his head off today. I'm not going there anymore. I'm not talking that way anymore. I'm not acting that way anymore. I'm not thinking that way anymore. I'm not going to be controlled by that anymore. I'm changing my habits. I'm changing where I go. I'm changing who I run with. The giant dies today. Would you raise both your hands again? Brother Troy, pray for us. Right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you, God, for this service, God. You've given such a clarion call to us, Lord God. Each and every one of us, God, have identified the giants in our lives, Lord God. We know how to knock him down, but Lord God, we've heard our bishops say, Lord God, that we will not stay there with a giant that's knocked out. There is not going to be a chance in this world that he raises up off of the ground in the name of Jesus. Right now, God, give us the fervency. Give us the determination. Give us the wherewithal. Give us the ability. Give us the anointing. Give us the courage, Lord God, right now to make the changes, Lord God, that would prevent this giant from living beyond today. Today he dies, Lord God. The giant will never again, Lord God, face me or my family, Lord God. My life is too critical. My family is too critical. My children are too critical. My anointing is too critical. My marriage is is too critical in the name of Jesus today Lord God the giant dies Lord God I will not stop I will not relent I will not walk away I will not be satisfied until he's completely dead Lord until I walk away with the trophy of his head Lord God God today I walk away with the trophy of a dead giant of a slain giant Lord God Lord when I raise my hands to you and pray Lord God, it'll be lifted high. The trophy, Lord God, of your grace, your people, Lord God, are victorious today. In the name of Jesus, lift your hands all over this house right now. Hallelujah. In the spirit, the next time you go before God, 
God. You're going to have the trophy of that giant with you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I worship and magnify your name, God. Thank you for your people, Lord God. Thank you for what you've done, God. Put your hands together. I am so thankful for a bishop. I'm thankful for my pastor. I'm thankful for the word of God. I'm thankful for the strategy that I learned today on how to kill a giant. Hallelujah. I'm going to face him and slay him and then move on. Praise God. Praise God. Are you excited about being in the house of the Lord this morning? Our God is so good to us. Praise God. I'm thankful to be among a bunch of giant killers this morning. Praise God. I got up this morning, brushed my teeth, looked into the mirror, had no idea that a giant killer was staring back at me this morning. But my bishop reminded me that I was looking at a giant killer. Guess what? You were too. You were looking at a giant killer this morning. My Lord, my Lord. Thank God. Hallelujah. I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing, and we're going to let you be dismissed. Lord, I pray, God, that your hand be upon every member of this church, God. They've come faithfully to the house of God. They've heard the word of the Lord. They know what the will of God is for their lives. I pray, Lord God, that you apply it in their lives. And, Lord God, let them go in the mercy and the grace and the power and the courage that you give to these giant killers. In Jesus' name, you are dismissed. We'll see you back tonight. Amen. Praise God. God, invite somebody into the house of the Lord tonight. We love you. You are dismissed in Jesus' name.